that in a minute. So let's begin with this. This old, grumpy looking 19th century person. Turns out he's actually an incredible individual. This is Louis Pasteur, one of the greatest inventors, scientists. I mean, this man is incredible. We all drink pasteurized milk, pasteurized juices. <coughs> this is the person who discovered that process. Just an amazing inventor. But not only that, in 1854, he actually came out with this quote. He's French. This was done at the University of Lille inside France. And he said, Dans les champs de l'observation, le hasard ne favorise que les esprits préparés. For those of you who are in AP French, or like French, this is the person who coined this amazing term, chance favors the prepared mind. And so when I'm thinking about, hey, journey into the unknown, and how that synergizes with chance favoring or luck, they say people are lucky, well, that favors the prepared mind. So as you all think about going off into the journey of doing new things of college or et cetera, yeah, it may be unknown, but if you've done your work, if you have a prepared mind, it won't be as hard. Are the examples of this? Well, let's talk about one of the original Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, if you will. This is John D. Rockefeller, at one point, the richest person in the country. Well, how did he make his money? He started a company called Standard Oil, um, and basically was in the oil business. So what he did is he supplied all the oil for Max. Now you're like, Dr. B, what, what's the big deal about that? Well, this is pre-electricity. So all lamps across this country, across the world, all light, this was the one guy, the one company that was supplying this. He got very rich, very quickly. But then these two people, Thomas Edison and Nikolai Tesla, kind of messed up his swag. <laughs> they invented this little thing called electricity. And all of a sudden, nobody was buying his oil for lamps, and he stood to lose an entire fortune. But he had a prepared mind. About the same time that was happening, Henry Ford and others came up with the automobile. And one of the byproducts, the waste products in this purification process for lamp oil was gasoline. He skyrocketed, and at that point became the richest man in the country, one of the richest men in the world, because he had a prepared mind. He didn't take it as a loss. He thought about, well, what else can I do in this industry? How about this person? And I apologize, the, the name is cut off. This is Alexander Fleming, Scottish person. He's the person who was working in his lab, 1927, 1928, decided to take a month vacation, took all his Petri dishes, stacked them up in the corner, came back, and a few of them had this fungus growing on them. And he noticed the ones that had the fungus growing on them had no bacteria on the plant. He's the person who discovered penicillin. But why was he able to do it? Because he had a prepared mind. He didn't take the experiment as, oh, it's a failure. He looked at that data and said, this is kind of interesting. What's going on here? Fast forward. This gentleman, many of you might not know him, his name is Carrie Camulis. He invented something called the polymerized chain reaction. Anybody who's interested in biology, this is the system that allows you to replicate massive amounts of DNA in a really, really quick time. Changed molecular biology and changed medicine as we know it. He actually won the Nobel Prize for this work. And he figured this out actually driving up Route 1. If any of you have been to California and you took that Route 101, that big winding New Zealand movie, et cetera, along the coast, he was winding up that road and it came to him based on some data that he saw before, but his mind was prepared to think differently. We all have cell phones, right? Well, the person who came up with the microphone that's in every single cell phone is this gentleman and his colleague. He's Professor James West at uh, John Hopkins University down the street, and his German friend, Gerhard Sester, they were working in a lab, Bell Labs at the time, and they accidentally left their equipment on. And they came in the next morning, and they heard this weird hum. And they're like, they didn't know where it came from. It turns out it came from this really small electronic component that they accidentally set up. And that was the rate limiting step for cell phones. We had a lot of technology to make cell phones, but nobody could figure out how to make a microphone much smaller than this. Imagine if your cell phone had to have this mic in it. Wouldn't fit, right? You'd have to pull your cell phone behind you in a wagon. Well, these guys came up with this accidentally, but they were in a prepared mind state to boldly go um, in a new place. All right, and so let's be clear. Every single cell phone on the planet has a technology. We all know this guy, right? Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook. Well, 
Before Facebook, he came up with FaceMash. He was just trying to share um, different people or rape different people on colleges, ca college campus, starting with his own college, Harvard. Then it went a little viral, Yale wanted it, Princeton wanted it, Dartmouth, et cetera, et cetera. And then he was like, wait, this is something new. But he, was a, he had a prepared mindset to look at that. And then he called it the Facebook, and it went beyond campuses, and they ended up dropping the term the and just called it Facebook, and now he has 1.7 and growing billion users of Facebook. Think about that. This is, if Facebook was a country, it'd be the largest country in the world. But he was prepared to think differently and look at different applications. But it's not just science and technology, folks. Even the field of education. Many of you know this person, Sal Khan, right? He was an investment banker working at a hedge fund in Boston. And you know, he went to uh, MIT undergrad, he did an MBA at Harvard, and he had some, some young cousins, nieces and nephews in, in, in the southern United States who were struggling in math. So he decided, well, I can't fly back and forth to the southern United States, I don't have time for that. Let me record myself on these short YouTube videos. He recorded himself teaching math stuff, etc put it up online for his, his family, his kids, to, his niece and nephews to see, and lo and behold, they went viral. He started receiving emails from people he didn't know. Parents saying, my son or daughter didn't know how to do math, didn't know how to do this, and oh my gosh, now they know how to do it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, led to the famous Khan Academies, which now services roughly over 10 million users per month allowing people to learn at their own pace and learn all kinds of things. So indeed, this cat, Louis Pasteur, really nailed it when he said chance favors the prepared mind. So I was asked to talk a little bit about my journey. So, um, I don't know if you can read it, but it says my journey into the unknown. Well, it starts with this. I put this up, um, yes, that's me. Um, the good old days when I could actually grow here. Um, what's really sad about this is if you I don't know if you see in the back, but I'm drooling. So the sad part is, I can't grow here anymore, but I still drool at night. <laughs> Not a good one. But how did I go? What was my journey to go from there to being a senior vice president at the Franklin Institute? All right. Well, it starts with this. I'm dating myself. Anybody in the back can recognize this? Oh, thank you, Ella. Thank you very much. This is for you younger folks. This is the old school version of your hand jump game. All right? It's called head to head football. Didn't have a lot of money growing up. I had a little paper route, my parents were really strict, they would, even though it was my paper route, and I'd hustle and I'd go up in Montreal, so it's a really cold winter, bring in the papers, do my thing, end up getting my little change, they're like, well, that's nice, but we're gonna hold that for you in your savings account. Finally, they let me spend a little bit of money to get this game. I bought it, and the problem was, I was like 10 years old, and it would go through these square batteries, these empty batteries, and they would just chew them up really quick. I was like, this is crazy, I can't afford to replace the batteries. So I went downstairs, found a little lamp, Cut the cable in the lamp, open the back where the batteries are, there's that red and black wire, tie, and I did not have your skills in robotics, I wish I did. I tied them together, I plugged it into the wall, best 10 seconds of my life. <laughs> I was playing this video game, it was fantastic, 11 seconds, poof, it exploded. <laughs> this is true. The outlet was charred in the wall. Now my parents are from the Caribbean. So my dad comes down, son, what is this thing you're doing here? You're trying to burn down the house? I said, no, dad, I was trying to be creative. But, but the reality of it, that single moment was my aha moment that allowed me to bridge that unknown divide and think about, wait a minute, what's this STEM stuff? What's this science stuff? What's this thing called electricity that I just thought you turn on a switch or you have an outlet, but it's way more complicated. And that led me from here to then becoming an immunologist uh, and doing some really cool things. But it didn't stop there with this, this kind of charge of into the unknown. So this is, of course, a map of the planet. These are some of the places I had the pleasure of living or working. And I'm going to talk about these four in blue. First, we'll start with Peru. So um, again, what do I know about South America? I grew up as a kid in Canada, came to the US, etc. Didn't know much about South America. But one of my um, research heads of the lab had the lab in Peru. And through that, I was able to bridge that unknown, learn about the Peruvian culture, and do some really cool things. I also had the pleasure of living in the Canadian Arctic. And that is cold. <laughs> that is true. And um, that photo down there, the person jumping into that very cold Arctic water, that is not me. I would just like to say that. But it was really amazing 
you know, even though I grew up in Canada, just so you're clear, most Canadians have no idea of the native population that lives in the Arctic. So that was really cool, charting that unknown. I lived in Haiti for about one year, working on measles vaccination projects. And that, I mean, what an incredible country that's storied with their history, a lot of big problems. But the people were such an amazing, strong people. And going into that um, unknown was scary. But then I upped it a year later with um, living in Africa and Sudan Khartoum. And if you want to talk about the unknown, and while I agree and appreciate um, Dr. Louis Pasteur, um, chance does not protect you or does not favor a, a, a trained mind here. That's a sandstorm, and there's no kind of pre-work you can do. When that thing hits you, it's absolutely destructive. All right, so then, but as was mentioned in the introductory remarks, I joined a team at Harvard to be part of an HIV vaccine group. And without getting into the details there, we were using DNA vaccines to try to cure HIV. You talk about unknown. Imagine taking little bits of the viral particle and putting them in people to try to have a protective vaccine. This is unbelievably uncharted waters. But all of that great fun stuff led me to one of my favorite places in the world, the Franklin Institute. Who's been there? Um, so let me just say this out loud and I will track this through Susan Boardman. All of you STEM Academy folks have an invitation on me to come to the Franklin Institute. All right? All right. Now, it's a fun place, but at the Franklin Institute, we don't settle with what we do. We still do that venturing out into the unknowns. And so um, here's our mission, to inspire passion for learning about science and technology. But one of, we, one of the ways we did this is we actually had, the, we started the Philadelphia Science Festival six years ago. Anybody participate in that? Oh, we gotta change that. This is a nine-day science festival with a hundred events in and around the greater city of Philadelphia. So I want to make sure that STEM, you guys at down to the STEM Academy actually participate. It's really cool. We do all kinds of amazing things in the building, out of the building, hands-on robotics. But then the most important point is everybody who participates does some kind of hands-on hands -on piece. Um, and it's, it's really exciting. We talk about bringing science for everybody, those in the womb to the tomb. All right, and now, much like you all, we have a school called Science Leadership Academy. Again, this was unknown. We're the Franklin Institute. We're a fun science center. We've got the giant heart. We've got the brain. This is great. But we weren't really a school, but we opened a school, not dissimilar to you all, called Science Leadership Academy. And then in 2010, we did the absolute unknown. This is what success looks like. This is where they graduate, right in front of Big Ben. And we had President Barack Obama come and speak to our students. It sucked for the graduating students after that, we weren't able to repeat that, but what an amazing experience for the students to hear from that. Um, and that brings me to the last piece I want to talk about, is some of the work we're doing in Africa, in Egypt. All right? So, <laughs> fair enough. So, um, we got funding from USAID to do this program called EKIDS, which stands for the Education Consortium for the Advancement of STEM Education in Egypt. We are literally creating STEM high schools like yours, like Science Leadership Academy, all the way in Egypt. We started two in 2011. We now have nine STEM schools in nine different states doing unbelievable stuff. This is a partnership, the Franklin Institute, 21 P STEM is in Philadelphia, World Learning is in DC, USAID is the funder, Ties is in um, Cleveland, and then that middle stuff, my Arabic got a little better. That says the Ministry of Education for Egypt. All right, the school, is radically different. It is based on grand challenges. This country here has something called the National Academy of Engineers. I know you know this, sir. Um, these are the best and brightest engineers in this country, and they came up with, with 14 grand challenges that if they solve these, they'll make the country a better place. Everything like clean water, better understanding the nitrogen cycle, reverse engineering the brain, I won't go through all of them, but if we can solve these grand challenges, we'll make not just the US a better place, but the world a better place. Well, we built a curriculum based on that. And so we worked with some people, some engineers, and a whole bunch of other people in education in Egypt, and we identified the grand challenges that faces that country. And these high school students come in, and from jump in September, all of their work, their science, technology, engineering, math, their physics, chemistry, biology, and their Arabic, and their history, all of the work is governed around solving these real, real challenges. And we realized that there's no point giving a kid a fake problem. Entrust them to have their creativity. Give them a real problem. And it's amazing what these students have done in just three to four short years. 
Here's some pictures. They all have projects to do, ultimately leading up to that capstone experience. Here's some more of the capstone projects. And you can see, I mean, there's no fake news. That's the thing about things like robotics and things like capstone projects. You can't fake it. When you're showing what you've created, whether it works or not, you understand what the processes are. Here's some of the young ladies from all girls school called Mahdi STEM School. It's an amazing school. This is an incredible water purification device that can desalinate water in a very short and cost efficient time. Um, then they have their massive capstone showcase. This is what it looks like. Those of you who've gone to science fairs, this is science fairs on steroids. These are not um, little students doing projects. I call these real scientists and little people bodies. It's amazing what they do and what they accomplish. Here's just one of the posters of carbon dioxide filtration. Really incredible stuff. Of course, the kids get thrilled when their stuff gets showcased. They get excited about it. So there's the occasional celebration. Um, this is throwing up one of the capstone leaders, one of the engineers who helped work with the students. Um, and then these girls, or these students in general, but we're going to focus on these girls here, really started winning competitions. Does anybody participate in the Intel Science Fair competition in this room? Well, you all need to, because you guys are big students here, you need to participate. All right, we got one. That's right, great stuff. So this is the world's largest and best competition, um, uh, STEM competition. And uh, they, they have satellite competitions throughout the world. So these girls came in um, second place in Egypt. These girls came in first place in Egypt, and if you win in your country, you get to qualify for the world champions, which happens here in the United States. It rotates between LA, Pittsburgh, and Phoenix. Um, here's a young man on the far left. He came in third in the Taiwan International Science Fair. Now again, these schools just started in 2012, and these kids are winning national and international competitions. The girls that came in first in Egypt then came to Las Vegas, I'm um, sorry, Los Angeles for the competition in 2014. And you can see them all excited. They actually won third in the world, right there on stage. Now again, these are girls in Egypt where, you know, it's tough to be a woman in Egypt. These kids should be married at 16, you know, two and three, four, five kids at, at 25. Yet these girls are coming third in the world, competing against the best and the brightest. Um, but it's all possible because we gave them challenges and they rose um, to the occasion. But my favorite is this. This is First Lady Michelle Obama. I wish I could play this, but I can't play this here. She actually referenced one of our students last year when she talked about the International Women's Day, called the student by name. Who is she talking about? This is where I get warm and fuzzy. NASA, in January of 2016, came up with this. What is that you're looking at, or you're asking? You can't read that, but NASA named a planetary object, number 31910, after Yasmin Fafra, who last year came in first in the world. That's what happens when you think about going beyond. That's what happens when you are ready and you have a prepared mind. This young lady comes from one of the poorest villages in Egypt, but she's super bright. She managed to apply and get into the STEM school, and now NASA has named the planetary object after her. It just doesn't get better than that. So yes, sir, Dr. Louis Pastar, indeed, chance does favor the prepared mind. And that's what you need when you need to go beyond Thank you very much.